Hello, Dream Team. A very warm welcome to you all once again. It is great to have you back with The Good, The Bad and The Rugby, Season 3, Episode 2. Episode 2, which if you've listened to Partridge, <laughs> you will understand. I'm not sure I've done it quite as well as him. Haskintons are here, back, ready to go once again. Pause for now. We've got quite a heavy-duty show to get into this week because not only has there been a huge weekend, obviously, in Aotearoa with uh, the Rugby World Cup up and running, Red Roses smashing past Fiji, Wales getting past Scotland with the last gasp penalty and the Black Ferns having to come from behind to get the job done against Australia in the opening round. So lots to talk about there. We'll also be looking uh, ahead to... Why are you whispering, Hask? What are you whispering about? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. If you're talking in class, you can share it with no, all of us. What are you whispering? <laughs> okay, well, I said I've never struggled to come from behind. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just said it. I don't know. I'm yeah, just thinking. Okay, good stuff. Well, um, there's the first edit of the show. There's the first edit of the show. I'll leave it in. It's probably we'll the funniest thing. We'll have less of that and more of the good stuff <laughs> uh, throughout the course of the show as we bring you the good, the scars, and the rugby. Uh, and we're obviously merging with the good, the bad, and the rugby for the duration of the World Cup. Elmer Smith is going to be alongside to discuss the big games and the stories and have a look at uh, the upcoming games as we've said as well before we get on to the good though unfortunately this week we are going to start a little closer to home with some of the bad it is what has been called the darkest day for english rugby and we've had a few of those along the way something that a lot of people have seen coming it's been fairly well telegraphed but even so when it arrived uh, it was unbelievably disappointing for all involved. And that, of course, is Worcester's liquidation. And our guest this week started his career at Worcester. He's since found himself back there for the last couple of seasons, and he has been right in amongst it over the course of what has been a pretty bloody few months. Matt Kvezik, thank you very much indeed for joining us. It's a ridiculous question to ask first up, but um, how are you? Uh, yeah, I'm all right. I'm not too bad, thanks. Uh, obviously, been pretty stressful last week particularly, and obviously the last six weeks have been... Uh, pretty difficult, but all good. Kind of over the worst of it now. Um, got a smile back on my face, which is probably what's needed. Are you so disappointed that you couldn't bother to get in the car and come down and see us? I was offered, genuinely was offered, but I was thinking about it, but I can't afford a petrol mate. I've got no <laughs> job. So <laughs> there's a cost of living crisis, Hask, and I haven't got a job. Sorry, so, okay. um, uh, yeah, I, will, lovely... uh, I would have made it down otherwise. It sorry. is a lovely clock. I do have one in my kitchen. Um... It looks, how, like, it looks like a Bond villain. I don't have a yeah, it does look like a Bond villain. The cat will just crawl across the screen any moment now. Um, <laughs> you, I can't imagine. Obviously, you started at the club. It, the club is at your heart. We talked uh, you know, before we came on about the legacy that Cecil Duckworth left um, and how the players seemed to be in such a good place. She came in, you missed that first game, then you came and had the, got the win that, that you so needed and played some great rugby. Is it just been a roller coaster of emotion? How have the how have the team stuck together throughout it? I'll tell you what, it's probably I've like genuinely been proud to be part of the group because they've been so we have been, I know it's looked a bit maybe sometimes on social media it looks a bit forced with this together, but there genuinely has been a real togetherness. We've had some really tough meetings. Um we've had some good crack in the changing rooms, like like you say, like the best way to get through some of this is with some humour. Um but everyone sort of stuck together. We missed that first warm-up game. We didn't probably put our bus, you know, best foot forward against London Irish. We were, let's be honest, we were underprepared. We hadn't hit a tackle in pre-season. We've done next to no pre-season training. Um, they're not excuses. We were probably beat by a better team on the day. But I think the following week at home, we turned up against Exeter, put a good performance in, and obviously get a win against Newcastle was great. So just the way, you know, you don't just turn up to a rugby match like that. You know, that's been a couple of weeks worth of prep, and it's, you know, under pretty stressful times, we've we've shown up well. Uh, Matt, can I just ask you a question just to give us a bit of a, a rundown of the timeline? Because lots of people who listen to Good Bad Rugby or watch it, they don't have a, a really big rugby knowledge. Um, some do, some don't. And they don't certainly learn anything from listening to us <laughs> week to week. But I wonder, if, can you just explain exactly kind of what's happened for the layman and sort of take, th take us through it step by step on what was going on? Working backwards, like the last week's been the toughest because we kind of knew this day on last Wednesday was coming. Um and we all sort of knew what was going to happen, which was liquidation of the company that pays all the staff, players and, and, and all that. So when that day came, that was probably the worst part because that was like the tip of the iceberg. But we're talking about this isn't stuff that's happened like the last couple of weeks, four weeks, six weeks. This is like last season. Like this is sort of stuff that's been dragging over. <laughs> like there's, I know there's one example and this is, it almost sounds laughable, but like we were, I can't remember what game it was, probably second or third game of the season last year. And obviously, normal Friday, so boys turn up a little bit late for team run, but the lads that aren't playing the non-23 are already at the club. Um, so those guys are training off feet condition on the Watt bikes. We're about to go out for a team run, and some guy comes up, he's a bailiff, and comes and whips away all the Watt bikes. 
like it's stuff like that you can't write because we hadn't paid any of the bills for the watt bike so they all got taken away we didn't have any supplements towards the end of the season because the bills weren't paid for that the tape the, 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 i say that you know the the um the physios and the snc particularly the physios obviously with 65 percent pay and, and no pay last month they were still coming in and, and and treating the lads but you know prior to the end of the last season we didn't have any tape we had no we had no tape to tape the lads with at the last like last game of the season and going into pre-season so it's probably like it looks like from the outside that this has just come been like a four quick four six week process and it's all of a sudden just gone to gone to shit but actually it's it's taken like we've been in it we've been in the storm you know late payments um not being paid on time all this sort of stuff for, for probably six seven months longer um and obviously now it's all come to a head where unfortunately the club's no longer what has been the chat since that sort of where you're running out of tape basic fundamental of if you if you a forward and you need holding together or you at your age at 30 you need holding together um what what was then the feedback that's coming back to you is it our oh, sorry was uh oversight or was was it clear to you there were bigger issues from that from that moment yeah i think it started to unravel a little bit towards the end of last season when you start realizing like i say you're turning up and a guy's you know taking the what bikes back no supplements, the tape budget's not been paid. We've got no new kit for next season. So when the wheel turned up this year, there was no kit. We didn't have a new strip because we hadn't paid the kit budget. I say we, it's the owners, the two owners who, you know, that's that's who I, I suppose it falls down to. Um, and the communication, so them, the communication with them was oh, non-existent? Mate. It was shocking. That, like That's being polite, to be fair. Um, last year, there was a n- number of times we got paid late and there was... There's always an excuse and a reason behind it. Um, I know we take, you know, the boys that do the RPA reps get a fair bit of stick at clubs. But to be fair, we had Ethan Waller last year, who was brilliant, and um, uh, Jack Allett this year probably didn't really sign up for what they expected. But they've been really good in terms of like liaising between it. But ever since this sort of winding up order came in a couple, well, what is it, like nearly two months ago now, they've just been so off radar. Like we have the last time I saw them, ironically was when we won the Prem cup. I just dropped that in there last season. But um, yeah, when we won that, that was the last time we saw them. So, yeah, so it came in and collected the silverware and then it disappeared again. They've st- <laughs> apparently much, they've just sold yeah, it. It's... Yeah. They just sold the Prem cup. You don't yeah, have it anymore. Surprised me, yeah. Um, I, yeah I was so it's, quick... been, it's been nuts. I was going to quickly say, Matt, I, I've actually met Jason Whittinger before. I sat next to him at a rugby dinner about three or four years ago. And I've, incidentally, I think he's listened to the show in the past and he's dropped the old message in through LinkedIn saying, enjoyed it, et cetera, et cetera. And just, we always try to be very fair and, and impartial and balanced on this show. And imp- impartial is definitely not right, but we try and be quite fair. <laughs> and I've invited him to offer a comment. I've invited him to come on and I didn't hear back. And I, I, that's probably not hugely surprising, but what would you say to them now? I and mean, I'm not sure we're going to get the chance to, to meet face to face again. But what what would you, what would you say to the two gentlemen who seem to have copped an enormous amount of flack over the last few weeks from your perspective as a senior member of this Worcester squad? To be honest, I actually did have a long phone call with him uh, last month. Um, so we didn't get paid on time. Obviously, we haven't been paid last month, but the month before, I, can't, I don't even know what month we're in. I'm in. My head's all over the shop. But whatever it was last month, we didn't get paid. So we were all sort of told to send the owners emails being like, listen, we haven't been paid. You promised it'll be on the Wednesday, which is payday. And it didn't. So I sent quite a, I suppose, forceful email basically saying that what you haven't paid us. You said you're going to pay us on Wednesday. You've lied. Like you haven't paid us. You've done this in the past. Um, quite a long email, which was quite stern, but fair. I think I was pretty fair with it. Um, and he called me back within like three or four minutes of the email being sent and being picked up and was like, look, I'm not a liar. This has happened. This has happened. Um, few text exchanges, long, long conversation on the phone where he was quite adamantly had it. But I was sat there going, well, you said you were going to pay us on one day and didn't. And that was end of Thursday. And then, then we didn't get paid on the Thursday. We didn't get paid on the Friday. And I'm sat on the phone to him on the Friday as he's there saying that he's manually putting through our payments like on the phone and I'm just I you don't know what to believe so it's it's such a bizarre I'm sat there with my own the owner of a rugby club like and he's manly putting through the guys pay it's just I can't it's, it's really hard to explain and like get your head around but like I suppose now it's kind of like I don't really have too much to say to him because everything that's happened has come out and been out in the press and the position we're in is down to them no one else's fault bar them and i think the worst thing that they could have done was that statement 
I'm not going to call it an apology, was the statement, which we'll probably you're probably going to touch on anyway. But I mean, I thought it was absolutely ludicrous. And almost, I was when I read it first of all, I was actually cooking dinner and I read it and I was like up and down the kitchen, must have done ten thousand steps. I was raging, <laughs> like honestly raging. And then it got to a point where I was like, do you know what? I was almost like laughing, like it was just. I, was, I found it quite quite amusing really um it's just they're so they're so far away from the human element of what they've done um i suppose they have to be because what they've done is wrong so they probably just can't look themselves in the mirror but for those who don't know the statement that you're referring to matt we're thankful to those supporters who turned up week in week out to support the club but sorry there weren't more nor enough of you on a regular basis to help make the club financially viable despite the significant personal funds we put into the club. I think that's the, the non-apology you're, you're referring to. We're sorry we didn't have the foresight during the pandemic to cut back on the squad budget, but instead remained committed to giving the club the best chance of being competitive. We're thankful to all of the staff that supported the club through COVID in accepting a significant reduction in their salary, but sorry that the playing squad could not accept a similar level of reduction, and in some players' instances would not accept any pay cut at all despite our openness at the financial impact this would have on the club. Does that stand up? from your experience not entirely it's not entirely true no we'd like we all took pay cuts through that period um i think what he's referring to is there's a there was i think maybe two maybe three players that didn't accept the pay cuts and the reason why they didn't was because they were retiring at the end of the year which i personally think is a fairly valid reason maybe maybe not i'm not sure but they, i think they were the, the probably the guys he was probably referring to um but everyone else took pay cuts we took a 23 percent pay cut i think i think that's what it was um with an option of if games got back at a certain date that there would be a a, a certain amount of that i think it was eight percent paid back which ironically they were late paying and and didn't get it all right as well either so um yeah i think that was quite unfair but you know we'll take that on the chin as players if that's what they believe and whatever. But I think for them to call the fans out like that is just, is mind blowing. Like that's the lifeblood of any club. Um, and Worcester genuinely has a really good fan base. And I think that's shown in the last probably what, four, six weeks that the amount of support we've had, not just from locally, but, but uh, all over the place. Um, and, you know, to I mean, call the fans sh- out like that, that is just, the, just mental. With, wasn't one of your sponsors prepared to pay for your trip up uh, yeah, Glasgow wasn't it? Pre-season. Yeah, Glasgow pre-season, yeah, yeah. and it was right. Steve Diamond who said, it, yeah. like, "Steve Diamond was like, well, hang on, let's not do this. We don't want you to be wasting your money if it goes further forward, isn't can, it?" Matt, can we? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I just want to know about because I have been in, in actually a similar situation, but this is not about it's not about me. It's about what's happened with with you guys, and I wonder. Very often, when these situations get quite difficult within within clubs, you kind of deal with it with your kind of gallows humor and that kind of, you know, being quite amusing about it. Um, and I think you've talked about the reality of, of the situation hitting home, but before kind of that D day, how did you handle these things? You know, was there a particular person that kind of came to the fore? Were you laughing? Was there some people that said, fuck these people, we're going to go home. Like, how did you keep functioning? Cause I, I would have thought pretty early on the writing was on the wall unless people were feeding you, feeding you bullshit saying that it's going to be salvageable and just talk us about that that dynamic and how you dealt with it yeah i think us um like any squad's got its characters so there's a few boys in the change room with like the dark humor that would you know they'd be putting the memes out on on the whatsapp group and uh, and then you'd have a few of the guys that would be more like oh, i'm not training today we're not being paid we're not training today um which is fair enough like we had a lot of very frank um conversations as like as players as um like a, just just a rugby department um to be fair to dimes he was really good at i think the knowledge that he was getting given from above which was very little and the information that he was getting was not a lot but he was passing that down to us which was i think he was doing the best job he could at the time and keeping us informed but the, the fact is is he didn't know what the what was going on really um and i think it got to a point where that glasgow game like you say um adam hewitt um one of our main sponsors he he agreed to kindly agreed to fund the trip but it got to a point where we weren't as a playing squad happy and to be fair neither was dimes about playing that game because we didn't know what the outcome of the the team was and we didn't want to risk injury not knowing if we were going to be paid or played or play the following week um so we did have some pretty frank discussions um and it was tough there were there were there were mixed opinions but i think the way they were held were really good like some guys were, were really keen not to be in the club some guys were um didn't want to train or we could just maybe just go and do your own thing and we sort of found a really really happy medium where everyone was happy 
in inverted commas, um, with the situation that was going on. Yeah, I think it's one of those where it's just, you look back and we handled it pretty well. Was there normally, there's normally a patsy that the uh, sort of the owners would send out. I mean, in our case, we had a few people that they send out as their public facing representative. I mean, obviously Dimes was getting information. Did anybody come out? Was the team manager trying to represent yeah. stuff going, come on lads, it's okay no, as the lights are flickering because um, the bail, bill hasn't been paid? We had a, a, a daily update from a chap called Peter Kelly, and I'm not sure what his. I think he was a direct manager. I don't know what his job was, to be honest, mate. I never saw him, but um, he would send out emails, um, daily emails, and it would literally be like, "Hi guys, no news today. Um, <laughs> hope you're all well. Um, speak tomorrow." It's like really? we're finding more out. We're li- honestly, and uh, some, and also his his the way he wrote an email used to rattle me so bad. It was just such poor, like there was no grammar, nothing. I couldn't get my head around it, and it really rattled me. But he would send these emails out like daily, and they just had nothing in them, and he, to a point where boys of them just replying to him were like, "Oh, thanks, great information. Like, really appreciate your help," and you know, just like the real sarcastic side of the side of it. Um. So he was the only one really keeping us in the loop from the other side. But I think obviously Dimes had spoke to a bit more to the owners and he was pushing it down a little bit more. But again, you, you take what they say with a pinch of salt. You know, I don't know if in, I don't think even he trusted what they were saying, to be honest. So, um, yeah. Do you do you think looking back now and obviously hindsight's a great thing that we always say. Do you think that they were the owners were in the club for the right reasons or was this? In some way, has this been? I know it's hard for you to comment, but was this their goal in terms of, you know, looking at the asset that is Worcester and the space that it is, and the and what you could do with that space? Was there always? Do you think there's now looking back, there's always been a sinister goal to them taking over and the companies that they formed underneath, and hopefully the inquiry will get to the bottom of this. Well, I think the property is now into the administration process. Yeah. I don't think they yeah, own, the, all they own the plant. Yeah. It's all come back, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, to answer Tins's question, I think. I think they like the idea of having this is completely in my opinion so I think they like the idea of having it but however I think the way they've conducted themselves over the last um, four to six weeks with the communications the way they spoke about the statements suggests that they never really cared about the club it was never about the rugby club for them I think I think I do think Covid um, screwed them over a little bit I think it brought their plans to what was going on in terms of investment in the club because Worcester's a great place to invest we've got an awful lot of land the stadium's great the facility's great so there's a ripe, a ripe opportunity to invest and develop that that stadium So was, which I think they saw and a lot of people see I just don't think they had any interest in the rugby club so um, I think yeah what they've I think COVID has sped that process up maybe if COVID hadn't happened we may still be here because they'd have had income from matches and they'd have had income from commercial side of things and all this sort of stuff. So that maybe unstuck them a little bit. However, do I think they had the best interest of the club at heart? No, is, is, is the easy answer. I wonder, Matt, from you, from you personally, um, just if you can talk about some of the emotions you've been through, because it's very interesting with with the good bad rugby, we've actually got three very different temperaments, as you might as you really? might guess. Really, it's shocking. Alex has his certain temperament. Tins has his certain temperament. I have mine. I think Alex on one. He's got a temper. There's I just no got a temper. About yeah. you. I mean, they basically tried to le- label me as some sort of psychopath, but um, I probably would have dealt with this. Uh, very differently in regards to kind of you know when people send you those emails they use third parties or they put statements out of that I can't really think past it I have to write stuff out and then delete it I mean we've had our own sort of legal battles as the three of us and and I, I've, I've written many a response to lawyers because they think they, they're free reign to talk to you in any way they want I just wonder with, with you whether it, you know it was incredulous and um, you were incredulous to start with whether you were kind of found it quite amusing and then as it kicked on towards you know, becoming unemployed, what kind of range of emotions you went through? What How did that manifest itself in any way? Did you smash the house up? Do you, you know, how, how did it go? No, I think like humour for me was probably the, especially last season when you see the guys come and take the Watt bikes and all this sort of stuff. And some of the guys you have, like that's, that was at the time it was funny. Obviously there's a, you know, it's not ideal situation to be in, but as the time went on and then obviously the winding up order came in, it came a bit more real Again, there's still like the humor in the changing rooms, which is, you know, which does keep you going a little bit. Um, uh, I'm a bit like you in the sense that there was, I'd be reading stuff on social media, which I either knew wasn't true or didn't necessarily agree with. And I'll be there like, I just want to apply to it. But there's no point because I'm not like, I'm no, I'm not an expert on administration or insolvency or anything like that. So I'm just opening myself up for a can of worms. 
and also to be fair luckily my wife um flesh she works for, for she works for the bbc and was kind of semi part of like uncovering all this land issues and all this sort of stuff and she's been really well informed she's had you know she's been a fairly decent presence on social media so anything that i've been tweeting basically has been like she's been like vetting for me being like no no do not say that because that will yeah you can get sued so um so i've i, I, know, how your wife feels, Matt. I know how your wife feels <laughs> working alongside this man i've got two filters yeah, i've got exactly. my wife and alex payne <laughs> Yeah, well, this is it. So she's been she's been ideal for me in terms of just like obviously not just supporting me at, the, at this like really tricky time, but just in terms of like helping, even like helping out the, the girls and stuff on the WhatsApp groups and just trying to ease uh, ease their minds with any good news that comes through and being a little bit more, um, you know, when the bad news does come through, explaining what it means, what does administration mean, what does this, you know, what's the outcome looking like? So it's not always good, but yeah, she's been useful for that, and I think that's probably kept me a little bit more grounded albeit i get it all day at the club with lads just taking the piss about oh we're going to be like jobless in like six weeks and all this and i come home and fliss is like oh you're probably going to be jobless in six weeks so <laughs> there was no rest there was like literally no respite for us but um no was, she was she was pretty useful can i almost distill it down into, into emotion by emotion can you reflect now at the point at which you were most angry and what it was that triggered it or who it was directed at was there a was there a point where you just thought this is now totally out of control there was probably two points where well, the most angry I was is, was the statement we spoke about where I was like, I read it and like I had the old red mist. I, there was no one in front of me, so I didn't know what was going on. I was like, it was, I was fuming with that because I just thought that was just, it was just so wrong on so many levels. And the other bit, which uh, I'm not hundred percent is, is if it's true, but it's been public, it's been um, out on, you know, social media and in the press that, um, the owners accepted a uh, a loan from Cecil Duckworth, um, who obviously has got you know he's basically Mr. Worcester. He's the guy who put Worcester to where they are. Um, he's done you know spent an awful amount of money on the club, but not just his money, but he's invested so much time as well. Um, you know, I remember back when I was playing, you know, you'd see him. We'd be training, and he'd just be walking around the stands picking up litter. You know, that's sort of that's how you'd sum him up as a bloke. Like that's what he was like. And he was just a good, good guy. Um, and I, I, as far as I'm aware, they took a half a million pound loan from Cecil whilst he was, um, whilst he had cancer, um, and then obviously subsequently passed away about a year or so ago, maybe a little bit longer now. Um, and as far as I'm aware, still haven't paid that loan back to the family, which to me, like that, even now, like makes my skin crawl a little bit because that's just, oh my, I, mean, I might be different, but I just, I just don't see how that is in any way acceptable like i just don't i can't get my head around that 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 reading that made me pretty upset and angry so they were probably the two times where i was actually angry yeah what about despair has there been a point where the tears have come and you've just sort of found it all too much uh yeah i'll be honest um like we said wednesday last week we had the um the liquidation of the company obviously um that was it was a weird it was a really weird time because like 10 days two weeks 10 days before that we knew that this date was set and we were coming it was coming to a head at some point um but even still like humor was there we were sort of just cracking on as normal preparing not knowing what we we're doing um and everything seemed okay even though we knew that day was coming and then when the day finally come it was a little bit like oh my god i'm actually jobless um like the club's no longer there I mean, ironically, like I'm actually halfway through doing a financial advisors course. So if you've got any contacts, please let me know. But um, I was. Um, Is it, do you I'm go through the administ- Do you go through the administration process as part of your financial well, course? I, honestly, it gets worse. So I was, I was literally on module four. Um, I thought, do you know what? Like burying my head with the news on Wednesday, I'll just, I'll crack on with module four, RO four, four, four whatever it is. Um, and that module was income tax. And I was like, oh, no, that's the last thing I want to be looking at, like learning about income tax. And I've got nothing, nothing coming in. So, uh, yeah, I've just sort of buried the head with it. And, um, yeah, that was probably the only time I was pretty upset on that Wednesday. And it was more of a realisation of what's actually happened, yeah. Um, and I just wanted to touch on that gallows humour. You mentioned a couple of people who sort of kept the WhatsApp. Is the WhatsApp group still intact? Are you all still yeah. sort of yeah, gallows yeah. humour? Yeah. on a day-to-day basis yeah we're not leaving i don't think until we get some more answers and look I'll be, like, a few boys are still training at the club here and there and uh obviously like congratulating the lads that have got obviously got jobs which is you know good for them um 
You don't sound that happy. <laughs> that was like the tightest smile yeah, I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still waiting for mine to come through, but yeah, we'll see. Um, but no, 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 he's still going. Um, there's a few boys on there. There's been uh, Jay Tyak and Murray Lowe have been, uh, Murray, Lowe, Murray McCallum, sorry, have been, um, yeah, pretty dark at times. And um, yeah, we've had a couple of, we had a good night out on Wednesday, which was pretty sort of impromptu, just a few beers. Um, student, only, student night, yeah, 10 for a pound. Definitely only yeah, a honestly, few. Where, where uh, the spoons? I, was, I don't, I went, we ended up in a place called Tramps. I have figured out that I hadn't been in Tramps since 2011. <laughs> that's how long ago I was like, oh, wow, this is, uh, this you is thought you were better. Let's um, hope that's not a sign of things to yeah, come. You thought you were better than Tramps. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we are. But um, no, it's been pretty good, to be fair. Steve Diamond. Uh, just in all this, you, you've touched on him a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I haven't met, I met Dimes a, a couple of times, never worked with him. He has a big, bit of a mixed reputation, I think it's fair to say, you know, like whether he's filling in journalists or, um, you know, he's kind of, he, he's still part of the old school in terms of some of the way he deals with things, which, I, you know, again, he's, he's never done anything wrong by me. But he's really come to the fore in this, in this case and has become out of it a bit of a kind of a hero. Why was he so, why was he so good? Can you give us any examples of, of it? Yeah, I was probably a bit like you, Haskell. I hadn't dealt with, I hadn't really had a huge amount to do with him before he came in. And when he was announced as like director of rugby, I was a bit like, oh, you know, you've, like you say, you've heard the stories and you weren't sure. And when he's, he's the thing I'd say with Dimes is he's the the best coach I think, I think I know that's got like just finger on the pulse of the squad. He, like he's very he just understands what's what the boys need, want, and where they're at. And I think that's where he's been really good. And obviously before this incident happened that's where he's been great so he's kind of like he's very black and white he'll tell you if you're shit he'll tell you if you've done all right well he probably won't tell you if you've done all right but he'll tell you if you're shit and what you need to work on um and he's very very open so and he's he's actually i was i was i didn't think he would be like this but he's very very approachable so i think over this period now which we which we've had like i said it's it's the meetings where he's been is probably the best example of it where he's been just very open and frank with what's going on and he hasn't he hasn't tried to pull the wool over eyes and say look everything's going to be fine and you know he's been positive but he's been realistic at the same time and i think players respect that because um you know it's it's one of those you don't want to be led down the garden path and then to find out that actually we are all screwed anyway which is what happened but um you know there was one time when he was he was pretty fuming that I think one of the owners had told him that um, that something had happened when it hadn't. I can't remember. It was on one of his tweets, and he said that the, the I think either the game was going to be on or something like that, and it wasn't. Um, so I might have made the preseason friendly, and he lost his he lost his shit at that in front of the uh, in front of the lads, and said he was pretty disappointed with the way he, he's been made to look like a mug by by the owners, and he was and he was open with us and, and honest about that. I mean, I think that's where everyone really bought into what he was doing, and then driving that sort of together stuff on social media which which he sort of led with Luke Broadley who was really good as well so yes yeah he's been he's been good and then uh, sort of moving it forward like trying to look to the future there where does where how are you feeling now obviously you think you don't hopefully you won't mind me saying that you're 30 years old 20, uh, 26 isn't it is that what 29, we're saying? Yeah. 29 1993 yeah. yeah just keeps changing yeah Six, seven, um, eight, nine, yeah. ten. i can we play just all check of. my wikipedia after this <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just keep, keep edit, edit 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 um yeah. you know you you had two years left did you on your contract yeah this so, season the next season yeah yeah so um where how do you look at it now are you obviously if you look at rugby in a whole uh, there's the oldest player that's uh, that's been signed for another player is 28 years old. You know the clubs are now operating at probably the lowest low, lowest salary cap that we've had in years. Um, so f uh, squads are shrunken. I mean, I'm feeling positive from this yeah. conversation. Yeah, 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 but, yeah, 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 yeah. Open, open questions. A little bit. Open Give questions. Me something. But are you? Yeah. But are you being very realistic? Of obviously, agents probably out there looking in every country for anything that you where you can play. Have you signed up for Tesco's yet? Yeah. Delivery driver. That's what or, he's asking. Or, I told you, I'm going to the job centre. I'll be on the job centre. So. All right. Are you? If you've got any you, more? If you've got any jobs going on, let me know. Sure, we're always expanding as yeah, a, as a, as a yeah, exactly. photo. We, um, uh, so how how are you? Fear? Are you just going to stick with it? That you you're going to find something in rugby, or you you're looking elsewhere? You know, did you did you have a a good relationship with sponsors at the club who would who might you might might provide you with opportunities in the meantime? Are you looking for something short time whilst hoping? How do you approach that? How mentally are you approaching that? Because you you're sort of left in a limbo. So have you found a way of dealing with that going forward? Yeah, I have. I suppose, obviously, I'm trying to 
like I, I still feel like you might disagree with me, but I still feel like I've got a bit of rugby left in my legs and I can still offer something. Um, which, if I was, if I was know, playing at 36, obviously... Kev, you're in far better nick than I ever was. So yeah, you'll be all right. Well, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure about that, but we, yeah, that's obviously the plan is to still play. Look, I've, I've got genuine, like I might be naive. I've said it before. I might be naive or stupid or just an optimist that there is some sort of future for Worcester. Um, I don't know what that looks like and whether I'm involved in that, but I genuinely think like, I genuinely hope that Worcester is bought um, and that there is a club at the end of it. And if that's the case, then for me at the moment, I'm just looking to some, for something to tie me over and, and get some experience over the next eight months or for the rest of the season that stands and then assess my options from there. That's what I would like to do personally, whether that's in the Prem, I'm, I, you know, fine. You know, I'd be, I'm, quite keen to experience something different abroad and I ask you've done that as well so um that would be quite a, so for me where I'm at now at my stage of my career I think that would be quite a cool thing to do and then on the you know if there's got to be a point where I need to get paid because I need I have bills to pay so this process of looking for a new club can only last so long so I am like you say I've there are guys in the local area and I'm halfway through doing a uh, a degree um which I'd like to finish at some point. So if there's a chance of getting some work experience and, and making some connections there or, or whatever that might look like, yeah, that's quite daunting for me, which, cause it sounds like I'm going down the retirement route, which is what I don't want to do. But at the same time, I'm not stupid and I'm, you know, there is a future after rugby, which I need to figure out. And that might look like, you know, uh, financial advising or whatever that might be or whatever it is, just trying to get some experience now. Yeah. Well, firstly, Matt, I mean, I think from all of us, please don't give up. I don't think you, I don't think you need to. I think you're, you're after third. Tins, I'm after after well, that. Yeah, I mean, let's, yeah. <laughs> we all give up on the back of tins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of tins' is meetings, honestly, we have to confiscate belts and shoelaces. So positive, Dan, yeah. <laughs> um, well, firstly, don't give up. I think, listen, you're, you're 30 years old, you know, you, 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 you played for England, you've done all, all, you know, done everything. I just, you know, I've relaxed on that front. I think it's obviously you've got to deal with the kind of, um, the impending financial thing and obviously you have a family uh, is that what I was going to ask is do you have the freedom to be able to go have you sat down with your your missus and said listen you know if I got uh, offered as a medical joker in France for example opportunity in Japan or one of these things that I may need to go uh, and get this sorted quite quickly because I think a lot of people don't appreciate that you know you're, it's not just you making a decision and upheaval and yes obviously your your, your, your partner's successful in her own her own right but you know how have you got that flexibility? Are you able to move quite quickly if it was to come about? Because a lot of clubs listen to the good, bad rugby. So yeah. if they need a back row player, we could sign you up. 10% commission though. Yeah, shout out. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, no, 100%. She's she's well on board with that. I think it's, look, there's obviously a circumstance which has come up, which it means I need to move quite quickly. So, you know, we need bills to be paid and whatnot. But at the same time, we'll, we've always had that in the back of our mind. We, You know, we're at a good stage. My, my son, Albie, he's only... He literally just turned three last week, so he didn't get any birthday presents. Bless him, because we couldn't afford them. But um, <laughs> that's serious. <laughs> I'm joking. Hell. I'm joking. <laughs> Mate, I'm we joking. almost, I, all, I we almost did, all cried. Yeah, <laughs> he almost brought. We're going to put a telephone no, number up on the bottom yeah, of the screen. Yeah, Please send great... presents. <laughs> <laughs> our shy, our yeah, producer no, yeah. Shira was like this. <laughs> literally, our face dropped. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to uh, keep it a little bit positive. Uh, now he had uh, he had a great birthday, so he's only three. So we're at a great age to actually go and experience something whether that's france japan wherever that might be i'm, I'm really open to it I, I would something i've always wanted to do i've been in the well this is like i think it's something like my made my debut for worcester in 2009 i can't do the maths so that's a long time being years, in and yeah. around the premiership yeah so it's in and around the premiership for quite a while so for me to go and maybe experience something abroad wh whatever that looks like i don't know and how that will look i don't know i've obviously you know, speak to my agent and he's putting as many feelers out there as possible at the moment, hopefully. But yeah, definitely would love to, if it means me going over there for the time being on my own and figuring what goes on and, but it'd be lovely to be able to, you know, get my wife and, and kid out to experience it with me. But you're right that you don't, you don't realize the impact that everyone losing their job has, because it's not just me that has affected. It's my wife and then my, and my son, you know, we've got, you know, Ted Hill, for example, he's lost his job and his wife works at his, uh, sorry, his wife, his girlfriend works at the club. You know the kit man is the same. You know, there's there's a kit man. He's pretty grumpy, but he's a good bloke. He's been there for years, and his wife as well works over the other side in the club shop and stuff. So it's like that's their whole life's been turned upside down. You know, so it's you're right in saying that it's a bigger picture thing. It's not like the same arrangement that Saracens had, where, where their wives used to work um, at the car park attendance on eight hundred grand a year, and the players are on thirty. It's not Ted Hill's got yeah. the same plan, is it? 
I, I honestly don't think that was the case. No, I'm not too sure. Not with our own, anyway. Fine. Can I ask you, you mentioned your, your wife a couple of times. Obviously, she's incredibly clued up on it. But, I mean, how hard has this been for her? Because I know that she's got great deep sort of affinity with the area and with, you know, the club beyond beyond just you, et cetera. I mean, to give us a little sense of how this scenario has impacted those closest to you. Yeah, I think for her, obviously, it's, it's been... Um, it's been pretty tough because obviously she's from Worcester, which is great. And that's hence why that was a decision. That was what part of the decision to come back was because this is, I, I'm not actually from Worcester. She is, but I kind of made Worcester my home, sort of left school at 16, come to my college up here and stuff. So we've kind of made Worcester is our home. Her family's here and stuff. So, you know, for her, it's been tricky because obviously this is, this is news. It's obviously not good news, but it is news. And she works at a, a radio station you know, for the BBC, which obviously, you know, telling news. So a lot of the time she's having to, you know, she's going into work where she's getting peppered by colleagues and, and you know, whatnot, saying, oh, have you heard this? Do you know about that? Do you know about this? Which generally she has already heard of, but a lot of it is quite negative and can, you know, can impact her as well, like, because it's our life that they're talking about. Um, so I think she's found that pretty tough, like, at work, albeit they've been really supportive and very helpful, but there have been days when she's gone in and she's been like, oh, just... You know, a bad news day for the club was, you know, she did affect her quite a bit because she was living it all day. Um, but on the flip side, like I said, she has been really positive and she's had some really good chats with a lot of people that have kept not only like myself positive, but I think she has helped a few of the, you know, the wives and partners as well, just to try and clear everything up. But um, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a, it's a tricky situation to be in. Um, she's panicking because she's now the breadwinner. So um yeah, you know, she's got she's got a lot of uh, pressure on her shoulders now. How's your cooking skills? Uh, your fatherly duties, so your home house husband. Yeah, How's well, that working out for you? Yeah, it's actually gone all right. I I do the school drop off anyway, so um, nothing's really changed for that side of things, which is quite nice. Um, but yeah, I suppose I could find a Hoover in my hand a little bit more and <laughs> walking the dog about eight times a day. Um, he's back, and bless him. But um, yeah, it's not too bad. Are you practicing your tackling and jackling on the dog as well? Yeah, so over the top. Uh, no, nah, not yet. Are we doing that with Albie? I'm teaching him. He's doing some bits in the garden with me. So we just got to. If any, if there's any other under under fives that want to come and do some tackle jackle with my son, then let me know because I think I'm still a little bit big for him. Um, it's interesting you were talking about those families where both have worked at the club and that the effect that's had. Obviously, Joe Yap, who I think is the director of rugby, the women's team, her partner is, is part of the club as well, or certainly was. Have you had much to do with the women's side of things there? Because, I mean, it's not obviously just you who've been affected here. It is the, it's the entirety of the Worcester Warriors setup. Yeah, so I actually spoke to Joe this morning. I bump into her quite a bit, obviously, at the club, um, and we spoke quite a bit Um She's done some stuff with Fliss at the radio to try and sort of promote the women's team as well. But yeah, she's in a really tricky position because she doesn't know, really know where they stand in terms of they haven't been suspended from a league or anything as far as I'm aware. They just basically need they can't they can't train at the club because we've got no insurance, so they're not insured if anyone got injured there. So they're having to train off site. But she's sort of like I don't she just doesn't know where she stands. She's in this real limbo where she's not getting paid. The girls are still training, like the women are still like turning up and training and, and preparing, but like she said, I can't even look for another job because I'm full time doing this still, if that makes sense. And I think her her hope is that the women's team, you know, will continue to play. Like I know they're affiliated with the uni as well. I think which has hopefully helped them out. With, you know, the uni can maybe you know lend their services in whatever way that means, whether that's financially or um, you know using facilities and whatnot. But um, yeah, I think there's it's still a lot of uncertainty, and you got to also remember, like you say, the bigger picture stuff is you then got the you know the 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 academy and the A schemes and the EPDGs, whatever you call it, wherever you're from. You know, you've got lads who are like 14 to 18 that have a dream of being a professional rugby player. Like I was in that setup, you know, however many years a long time ago, and you do you dream of playing for your setup in the club and and, and pushing through and playing for Worcester Warriors, but that's now. You've got lads between eight, 14 and 18 that don't know if that can, they can do that. So where do they go? Where's their catchment area now? Like, what does that look like, you know, for for the rest of the sort of rest of the community, really? It's, it isn't just, a, you know, this is, we're talking not just Worcester, we're talking like, you know, South Birmingham, Birmingham area, you know, fringes of, like, I think I think Nick Easter mentioned it on on uh, BT Sport yesterday, where it's like that catchment, the whole catchment area is affected. Um, and that's quite sad, really. Like, there's, you know, there's guys that aren't going to know what to, you know, what to do or what to to dream about playing rugby. I don't know if they can do that now. 
It's, I mean, it's astonishing the, the far reaching impact of something like this and the way it happens. I actually, if, I, I want to ask you about the bigger picture in just a moment too, but just you personally, are you up for a game now for anybody? I mean, if Minch, Minch and Hampton Seconds have got a, a vacancy at 12, do you want to sort of offer a bit of versatility or you, have you got to stay in prime condition? I'm not playing outside tins. You know, no, exactly. There's no way I'm playing outside. You never get the ball. Yeah. And when, you do, ball, be, exactly. when you do it, when you do it, your knees. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from a man uh, who had two penises for hands. <laughs> and, and he fondue, actually, he's dropped his water twice while we've been filming the Sunday stage. I had a change. fondue set and a house brick, I think you'll find. <laughs> but, but are, I mean, are you looking for... If, if Cornish Pirates came and said, look, Matt, do you want to come down and, and play with us for a month? You, you know, are you, are you keen to sort of put your boots in a bag and go and travel? Or are you trying to stay fit, ready for, you know, a multi-million pound deal in, in Japan? Yeah, well, that'd be lovely. Um, yeah, I sort of... I'm open. I'm open to to whatever sort of comes. It's got to be the right thing. I don't. Re- do, I don't really want to just bounce around month to month. Really, like that would that would be a lot tougher for the family. Um, I think like you know, be, spending however long there and then going somewhere else and and not really knowing where whether I'm coming or going. I think for me, like if I could find something till the end of the season, that would be that would be the ideal situation. But I'm also you know beggars can't be choosers. So uh, you know I'm at a point where if it's the right thing for me to do you know if this process drags on and i'm you know sat here in uh you know in a month or two months time without any sort of hope of getting something then maybe i will start to you know become a sort of gun for hire i suppose and just you know but uh, that's not really the area i want to go down i want to try and get some solid you know some club rugby in um and then assess after that but who knows okay so now the club is in the hands of the administrators are you getting more information from them as to the potential outcome of of the process no not really because we're obviously not employees anymore um so i don't think this it doesn't really whatever's happening now doesn't really affect us of course it does but it it, it doesn't really because we're not actually employees of the club anymore um so we're not getting any more updates whatever i'm finding out it will be through word of mouth through you know connections to consortiums that are through you know various different people or whatever that might look like but we're not getting anything from the administration no it's just sort of social media and news really the, the, the question i wanted to ask you matt was you know in your position now as you sit here what what lessons do you think should have been learned from the process that you have been through as players I suppose as players it's like oh you could you, you could go back like basically say you prepare yourself for the worst case scenarios so like no one expects you don't expect to sign for a club and then outlive the club like that's just like mental but you know that's happened that's happened to us so I suppose and I've probably been guilty of it in terms of you know I'm I don't I didn't go to uni like rugby was everything at the you know back in the day so I didn't do the uni things and I wish I'd be more proactive earlier to make sure that actually if something like this happened, which look, let's be honest, it's rugby at the moment doesn't look financially very strong um, with, with obviously us folding wasps, you know, not looking in a good position. There's, you know, other clubs that are struggling financially or whatever. Um, just be prepared to have something to fall back on. I know it's easy for, to sit here and say that, but like if you are, like, if you're at wasps or wherever club it might be and you're 24 and you're thinking, Oh, I could do with doing something or I haven't been to uni or, you know, do it, be proactive. Don't leave it till like, like me, leave it till you're 29 to figure out what you want to do because it creeps up on you. Those 10 years really creep up on you. Like I say, you made my debut in 2009. That's 13 years ago. And that's felt like two. So it's like, before you know it, you're like, right, what am I doing next? And then to have it whipped out from under your feet so quickly is really, really tough. Um, and I suppose in terms of the process, like what do we learn from it is like, I hope the RFU learn that they need to do better due diligence on owners because, or whoever it is, RFU or pre, you know Prem Rugby, they've got to have a little bit of a, you know accountability for what's happened because at the end of the day, they allowed in some form or another these guys to be in charge of a rugby club, and the, the fact is now is they put the club in where it is. Um, if there was more due diligence or if they had done more homework back then, would they have been allowed to have the club a bit like you know the I think it's the, is it EFL? the test yeah. they do one of the owners failed one of the owners failed that at Morecambe so That's right. you know if they're failing that that doesn't look great does it um but yet they're allowed to own and run a rugby club um I suppose so I the challenge around that a and actually I read in one of the papers that the EFL um fit and proper owners test is five pages and for a premiership rugby club it's two paragraphs but I think the challenge with that, Matt, is that in football there are a lot of people who are keen to invest and in rugby there is absolute lethargy amongst 
current investors, let alone people coming around the corner. And therefore, if people express an interest, I think rugby is yeah. quick to say, come aboard and dive in. Obviously, you alluded to them, you know, reclaiming what bikes and some comedy moments. Um, I've said a num for a number of years on on Good Bad Rugby and every other podcast that'll have me on, is that rugby is not as professional as it makes out, and that you know some of these things are quite commonplace in clubs. You know, I experienced it, you know, quite dramatically in the last couple of years at uh, Wasp with you know the generators running out of fuel and the lorry, you know, the generator being picked on the back of a lorry and Dai Young having to stand between the generator and the lorry, and obviously the choice between running Dai, you know, Dai Young over and doing 500 grand worth of damage to your truck or letting them keep the generator was was a non-brainer. No -brainer. Did you, you know, could you, can you sort of tell the listeners just how unprofessional it you know, has been the, the, this period for you and how unprofessional is your experience of, of rugby in general? Uh, it's tough. Like these last, it's I, I don't want to say we were, we were, we're not an unprofessional club. The, the players, the staff, the coaches have been some of the most professional players and, and, and uh, organization I've been involved with, but it was the way it, it was just the way it was run was like, it was a, a semi pro team, like not having tape or having to like ration tape for lads ankles and stuff like that it's like you you can't like boys have ankle operation i'll tell you another example this is even worse right i i am um, i rolled my ankle on the uh i got snipered nowhere near the ball rolled my ankle on the uh 4g playing exit last season um did all my ligaments was fuming rehabbed it back ended up going for an operation sort of last game of the season so i've had and i've Fit and healthy now, just so you know. So if there's anyone watching this, I am fit and healthy. Well done, well played, well played. I'm back, back playing. But um, I had a, you have to do like an MRSA swab, don't you, to go in to have your operations. So I did my MRSA swab at the club. I then went to booked in for the um, booked in for the ankle lot with Pereira over in Wales. He's quite well known. Um, he was like, "Oh yeah, we're expecting you for this time, but we haven't had your MRSA swab back yet." And I'm like, "Right, okay, I'll call the doctor, call the physio." They're like, yeah, we've sent it off, but the club haven't paid for it, so they can't release the details of it. So I was booked in for like a seven or eight o'clock slot in the morning for my op, but I was going to have to wait to the last person of the day because they hadn't paid for my MRSA swab to to have my operation. So it's and then that would have meant that I'd probably have had to stay in overnight, which would have been, you know, it just it you I, this is it's things like that that you can't. It's almost like you can't say, like you can't explain it, like how that's what I mean with the professionalism. In terms of training, like we we were very very professional. We trained really hard. Dimes got us, you know, we we we've probably stripped it back from where we were the season before or um, when JT was there, and we got back to a little bit of the old school stuff with Dimes. He's you know he's waving his massive stick around trying to whack us in the head, but you know it worked. It, it, that sort of stuff worked for us. Yeah, I know, but yeah, in terms of like the professionalism, it was just the way the owners were. Or the way the club was run, I don't know whose fault it was, whether it's the owners or not, because I don't think they really knew what was going on. They just weren't paying the money. Um, it's so hard to be professional when you don't, you, you just, you haven't got the resources that other teams have. You know, other teams have all this stuff and taken for granted. You know, Dimes was great because we, when, when, we, when we had last season, so I'm talking a lot, apologies. When we were on, when we were last season, we only had two two physios. Like we only had, two physios and like no tape so dimes would come in and was like look we're going to strip the squad back but we're going to hire more physios because you guys you know you put your bodies on the line every week you're going to get broken so to do that we'll look after you and by doing that we'll give you the best physios and get you more physios so rather than having to wait four hours after training for a slot you can just pop straight in so you know that takes the pressure off everyone else like the staff and and all this side of things more s and c in the gym you know we were running off one s and c two s and c's and two physios for a whole squad of probably 45 players which is just it you just can't do it so we we're sort of on the back foot from the get go really obviously for you you are right in the eye of the storm and it's an utterly utterly desperate time and and obviously you know our thoughts are with you and, and everyone associated with Worcester there is just a sort of semblance now a lot of people saying this has to be the last time that this happens, although we may, might find out on the 19th whether or not, it you know, like buses, another one comes along. I don't think it is looking very good for Wasps, unfortunately. But in terms of resetting a little bit, so one of the quite interesting things, and you're talking about governance and accountability here, in France, the top 14 has an independent auditor. As a club, you have to submit audited accounts, and if you're not financially stable with proof via audited accounts, uh, you can be expelled from the league. 
if your accounts don't stack up going into the season, your owner can be asked to put down a bond that covers the player's salary for the entirety of that um, upcoming campaign. There is a 12-month forecast that needs to be submitted in advance of the season. If you don't hit it, they can then reduce your salary cap. So they are absolutely all over the sort of fiscal discipline that means the league maintains its integrity. I mean, what we haven't even discussed here is that should Wasps, and obviously we're speculating, but should Wasps go along with Worcester, clubs are going to are going to lose two home games this season, which could be up to £400,000 from their bottom line. I, I mean, mean the, the, the impact of this, obviously we're talking to someone in Matt who's been there, lived it, and, and is, has sweated the emotions. But the repercussions of this actually are going to filter out across the entire league. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, we're, in, we're in a dire period of time. I think we've been talking about the state of the game for, for, for such a long time. Um, and, you know, the French bureaucracy sounds like it's the perfect recipe for what, for, for what needs to happen. The problem is, I doubt, I doubt a lot of those premiership clubs could match any of that. And there's probably a few of them with the, you know, I think probably Bristol's owner, Bath's owner. There's probably a couple of guys there with with um, the money, kind of money to cover it. But the guys who get into rugby more often than not, they're, they're not, you know, billionaires. They're guys with some money who I think look at rugby as an opportunity to grow it because it's a, uh, you know, it's very interesting. We look at sort of a lot of blue chip companies. You know, a lot of their staff love football, but a lot of the managing directors, CEOs, and owners love rugby yeah. um, and they sort of get into it thinking they can grow it kind of not realizing that, that the big drain on, on, on re, re, resources and I think I think the premiership is in is in a real uh, state of, of, of problems because I think I think COVID accelerated uh, what was already happening mm. you know because I think Worcester probably could have scraped by for a period of time I think Wasps could have scraped by but I think you know a lot of players did take pay cuts across the league um, you know a lot of those have stayed pay cuts they've reduced the salary cap but again, I think the marketing. I think also, you know, I think Tins actually said it last time was, you need multi-use stadiums. That's the only way rugby can be successful if you have a stadium. Well, hang on, Wasps are in a multi-use oh, no, stadium, yes, and they're the, the ones yeah, that are about. No, but they bought it just before COVID. Yeah, though, they, they bought it before COVID, really and then they them. also took out a bond. You know, because that's classic. That's a classic case of people trying to make money out of something and forcing it. Do you, Matt? Do you, do you talk to other players when you're out and about? As to the situations at other clubs, do you know of other clubs where they are worried about what's going on in the boardroom? Uh, I suppose we did a little bit during COVID. Um, yeah, you speak to other lads at COVID because obviously boys were talking about cuts, like we spoke about there. Some lads were like, oh, "Bang straight on twenty five percent cuts." So some teams are like, "Yeah, we'll do twenty five percent, but we're getting a payback." Other teams are like, "Yeah, we're doing twenty five percent, and then you get all your money back." once we back up and running and COVID is finished. So that happened at Exeter with me. Like I had three months at Exeter where I wasn't paid my money. I was paid 25%, which was what was agreed, which was, was the right thing to do. And everyone was on that. But the players that left that year, they got paid that 25% back um, for over those three months. So there was, everyone was in different situations. So we probably spoke to more during COVID about that really, but we don't no, play. It's not really our business. Like we are, we're just the pawns on a chess beat, like chessboard, getting pushed around, and you know, go and play here and and do this sort of thing. We don't really. You know, I didn't sign for Worcester, and I didn't want to question whether the owners could afford to pay my salary or anyone else's salary for that matter. That's not. It doesn't seem like it doesn't seem right. You just that sort of not really expected. Do you see what I mean? So you yeah, really do. ask other lads to be like, oh, how how's the situation at? You know, Gloucester heard you guys are so and so. It's like it, it, you don't really speak about it too much, really, unless there's something come out in the press like the Wasp or our situation or Wasps, or and then obviously other other teams get sort of you know pinned to that maybe. Which oh, you heard, heard New, Newcastle have, have been struggling or whatever that might be. Um, you know, for example. But it's one of those where you don't really, we, don't really we say got, it. We got the Newcastle guy on Seymour Curdy. Seymour and. <laughs> I mean, again, uh, obviously everyone has a right to reply, but we got Seymour on and he said a load of stuff and then we got contacts by a load of other people saying that what he said was utter bullshit. Do you remember? I do remember, yeah. yeah. And, and so it's very weird because I, I think it's, it, what, what I found very interesting about this this whole thing is that you're exactly right. You got you you expect the expectations when you sign for a club, everything's gonna be taken care care of. You'll but that's be probably what your agents are. I bet you the agents now want to see audited accounts yeah. before they well, sign any player to any because, club. Because if you, you, I mean, Wasps were signing. I mean, they signed. Um, you know, I think even even Dan Robson they they signed at the time on a a PDF walkthrough of a training facility 
that took six years to mature. So they were sending it out to players, going to their agents, going, if you sign at was, this is what you'll have. And it was like, we'll have it this year and next year and next year. And they were still signing people off the back of it. So all of this stuff has been going on for a long, a long period of time. I'm just, I'm just very much like Matt, that you sign for a club and the expectation is you'll be given all the tools to do your best on the field and not look not look into it but then when we get the owners on that they'd equally say you know well we're trying to put money in we're trying to support you but actually there's no i don't f feel a sense that anyone has a grip or anyone has an actual idea what the what is going yeah. on because we had seymour <laughs> here and he basically you know allegedly was talking utter crap about how it was and why he reduced the salary cap and we didn't we never we never went after him or we never got other people on to counter it but that was a an interesting point those owners in their mind to come out with a statement you either have to be so arrogant and blind which men are guilty of all the time and so narcissistic that you can't possibly see but they probably genuinely believe what they're saying that the players didn't take enough that the fans didn't turn up enough I mean, what what is the truth of the matter? Who's looking yeah. into it? Somebody needs to take this by the scruff of the neck because I promise you, taking the old gentleman's handshake, which is what the premiership was built on, you know, good good boys doing good things and st sticking to their word, is gone now because it's yeah. pr people have proven they're full of shit. I mean, it, that's the, we're, we're in such a confusing time now because, you know, you, you have... <coughs> Mike from... This is Mike, isn't it? Michael from uh, Rock Nation saying play, Mac. players need to be allowed to be about tall poppies and stand out and you need them to create all that sort of fame that bring be superstars to bring people in you got ellis asking the question like why do we need a salary cap because if you uh, because obviously at the same time your mate was saying that if you put a salary cap on you're limiting the money that will come in because why is a billionaire going to want to come in and buy a club and then not be able to spend whatever he wants to turn it into something so we're sort of stuck in no man's land where everyone's saying something different which kind of which affects what we're doing right now and what is the best way of doing it i still think you know you look at some of the rugby that's been produced in the premiership this year it's the best it's the best start to the year we've had in. And how sad that we've done an hour on the financial disaster that is facing yeah. the game rather than the rather than everything that's going on now points obviously obviously the rugby so world cup over in in new zealand it's it's this is the frustration of our game and and someone needs to take a, a grip we've got too many company too many uh, companies that are invested in each for segment of the game. So there's not one, there's not one thing. There's everyone trying to take their pound of flesh, as you say, built on a handshake of what was rugby, a hundred and God knows how many, nearly two hundred years of handshakes and and amateurism. Whereas we actually we're twenty six years years in professionalism. We might need to look, we need to learn a bit quicker. Can I ask you about two quick questions just to finish? What do you hope or what do you expect to happen to Worcester from here, the club? Hope or expect? Uh, give us both. Uh, obviously, well, hope, I suppose a bit of both, really. I hope that there is some sort of future for the club. I think there are still, and we see it in social media and sort of rumours around Worcester, that there are still two, well, this is definitely one interested party consortium that's been quite vocal. Um, and apparently there is another one. Um, and they're, I think they're fairly far down the line in terms of like administration talking to administration and things like that um so for me hopefully the club gets bought what that looks like this season going forward is going to be pretty tricky um because obviously we're not we're not going to be reintroduced into the league so it's how they manage the um expectation of next year in terms of what the squad's going to look like um you know whether we are well we're obviously relegating into the championship next year with a w with an appeal option um uh, which you know I think is probably not a bad way to go to try and get us back in the Premiership straight away because for buyers that would be massive in terms of you know keeping P shares and <clears throat> all that side of thing all that all that sort of stuff as well. So for me, hopefully there will be a club next end of you know, next season. Um, whether that means whether I'm there or involved in it, I don't know. And but you know hopefully we can we can be back. Worcester can be back and competing in a league. I think uh, the sad thing in all of this is that. We're just once again, it's another show where we're just surrounded by questions and finding answers is very, very difficult to any of this, really, isn't it? I mean, I think, Matt, I, I, I sort of want to leave it there. Will, will you keep in touch with us? I mean, we, honestly, send in your CV for the T, T boy job. We'll, um, we'll yeah, put you to the top of the pile. But in all seriousness, I, I think we're all incredibly sorry for what you and all your teammates and all the, all the yeah. people associated with the club have had to go through. Um, and we really, really hope that something comes and comes quickly so that you're back in your boots doing what you should be and not sitting here talking to us about debt and insolvency and your um, IFA exams. I mean, it's it's just a, a horrendous situation to be in. Yeah, it, it, it is. And I think we've obviously had 
a, a show with ups and downs and, and levity. And I think it's important to say that we don't underestimate um, just how devastating this is for people involved. And like you said, it's the, you know, it's the tea ladies, the kit man, the groundsman, the, you know, the office staff, the players, the physios, the, the you know, the wives, the girlfriends, the, the children, the fans, everybody in that whole mix. And, you know, it, I was quite close to it a couple of times in, 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 in my career. And I understand how, um, devastating it can be but we were salvaged um at, at the final hour um and i think you know we tried to give a mixed review of what's going on there are obviously lots of lots of problems but i think the way you guys handled it um was outstanding and i think you know fingers crossed that everyone will find a will find a home what that looks like we, we, we don't know okay but don't give up chief we don't want any of that you know becoming an accountant or whatever it was you were going to do <laughs> we don't need that nonsense there's a lot there's a long i tell you what because you can a, turn boring when you're older so. yeah you're a long time retired <laughs> yeah. mate there's hopefully more life to live doing something else than doing rugby so keep playing as much as you can what's um what's next matt what have you got next couple of days later today what's what, what how are you keeping busy uh, fit etc to be honest I, I can't let it go i'm full stash still going to the club using okay. facilities so <laughs> <laughs> i was i was at, i was there running this morning um doing some weights um Lower, lower limb weights as well, which I was surprised. I got my head around doing some of them. I thought it'd just be strictly arms now. I've not got a job, but... Um, don't skip leg day. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it, really. Just trying to stay fit. Just trying to, you know... It's just quite nice to get to spend a bit more time with... Uh, uh, in the little one, even though he's in nursery every day. So I don't actually get to see him. So uh, we'll fill the days up with something and um, figure it out. But, yeah. Good on you, Matt. Thank you so much for joining us. Keep yourself head above the waterline and you know these things do come around in the end i promise you you will find a, a point at which you can laugh about it and there's there's something else to to sort of concentrate on so keep pedaling in the meantime but thanks for joining us and thanks for your honesty in over the course of the last hour or so thanks mate thank Cheer you very bro. much Cheers, i still claim petrol expenses or even though i'm not coming down <laughs> i would yeah, yeah. we, yeah. we, we, we love having you in the studio can we to our game on the 20th i'm not sure what the uh what yeah, the well, expenses yeah, we'll are we'll have a look at that we'll see what's going on with that yeah Cheers, good on Kev. you dude mate keep well thank you so much all the best how very sad that we are having to have shows like this yet again i mean i say yet again we, we sort of seem to spend a lot of time talking about the state of the game um I think the one thing I'd say to him is if Wasps come in and say, do you want to come and play for us? I wouldn't be signing that contract any time in a hurry because it, I, I think we may be having this discussion again in the not too distant future. Are we reaching a a point where rugby needs to say, what the hell is yeah. going on? We need to reset. We need to build a game that is fit for the future, that is built for the athletes who now play it, not for who played it 150 years ago. Safer, more marketable, more centralised, more joined up. Y yes. It's Yes, it's got to get better. Uh, but I think, I, I think to be honest with you, they missed the boat with COVID and the opportunity. And the and I think what will happen is it will tear itself apart and will fall apart. And then someone will pick up the pieces because at the moment, you know, trying to get a consensus on what is sensible, a global league, a sensible premiership, uh, who runs it, who organizes it, you know, is it RFU? Is it the PRL? Is it the owners? What 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 is the direction of the premiership? What is good marketing? What is bad marketing? All of that is up in the air. And I think, I don't see, they haven't been able to do it yet. Will men ever be able to sit around and have a conversation, get on with it? I don't see it happening. Can I whisper something sinister? Yeah. What happens if everyone wants this to happen? Then there'll be no owners of our clubs, and then we get control of the central club. Well, that, yeah, franchises. Yeah, I mean they did that in they did it in New Zealand, didn't they? I mean New Zealand have got the fran. I mean they've got what the franchise. Is the, what is the biggest problem with everyone else in the world? It's two leagues, isn't it? The French and ours, because the they're owned by the leagues are run by. But they're twelve. Well, there they're now will be eleven independent businesses as opposed to one business with eleven competing yeah. teams 12 13 whatever it's going to be I, I can't i just can't see you know uh, even for some little things like we had brett gosper on right and we asked brett about um you know the citizenship debate about letting players return to their um to their home nations if they haven't played a certain number of games he, he, they, they delayed that for so many years because they were all concerned that it was going to destroy the integrity of rugby was going to change the landscape well it's, it's made absolutely no difference to anything it's been better for the game when they made the decision we had an, an opportunity to um put a global league together to put Global things season, to go season sorry and put everything together in the right place they just didn't happen because sansa sold the rights didn't they is that what Apparently they did? So, yeah. yeah sold the rights and messed the whole thing up we can't get, we couldn't get a consensus on that we've got no ability to manage the there's um, nothing there's no fast changes no. we are we are a <laughs> snail a paddle boat oh, but uh, the, yeah the, the, we're a freddie Fl <laughs> freddie flintoff pedalo yeah. going down the river whereas that you hear rumors that they're going to move the rugby championship now to mimic the six nations is at the start of a global season 
we shall see. Thank you podcast. for swinging by. See you next week. Yes, you're indeed, going to stay. We're going to talk about some of the good stuff in a minute. Yeah, we will. Yeah, let's do and it. And I think we can be positive. I think we should shed light on, on bad things, but I think we should be really positive because, again, if you can't fix it, just get the fuck on with it. And congratulations to the Red Roses smashing it in their first they game. Are. Let's talk about the good things because we're going to be bringing it home. We are. We're actually going to bring in a better thing than you. We're going to have Elmer in yeah. in just a moment. So Thank you, you can though. vacate. Debate. Thank you, the tins. Thank you very much indeed for your input this week. Quick step change for us. Before we do that, though, a little note from our friends at Honda uh, to tell you about the new Honda HRV. And it's beautiful, clean, stylish lines. Something that, as he goes, Tins never managed to hit during his playing career. Apparently, Honda are yet to spend a lot of money on decoy lines. But they are, however, beautiful, clean, and stylish. Comfort up front, apparently, which will work with Hask. Comfort at the back, not so much for Hask. Very clever tech, which obviously is a tech biz entrepreneur I'm extremely excited about. Even more so, because apparently it keeps you safe and secure. And as we all know, I am a man for the little bits of detail and getting them right. So... Uh, that is the detail as far as the Honda HRV is concerned. Unlike us, I'm told that Honda love and listen to their feedback, mainly because it's probably not quite as abusive as ours. They have therefore built a car that is so human-centric, it meets all of our driving wants and needs. Everything you need for everyday life built from the ground up, would you believe? And you can find out more about the new Honda HRV at www.honda.co.uk forward slash HRV hybrid. Go forth and enjoy that if that is your thing. Step change, as we said. We've done the, the bad on this week's uh, GBR. We're going to do the good now. Elma Kapelma, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Very nice to see. What do you make of the new home? It's I... a little orange for you, I know, because we'll have more red when good Skaz rugby is back. But I, I love a little orange. It reminds me of the sun, and I don't see her all that much anymore, no. so it's welcome, nice. Welcome to England. Um, we're sort of cutting into the good, the Skaz, and the rugby. Um, on the good, the bad, and the rugby, we are sister shows and friend shows over the course of the next few months because of what's going on down in New Zealand. Have you spoken to the Golden Girl? Have you a little yeah. message? How My mate getting... Emily, she's down there. I've been all over the place just getting people to send messages of encouragement because I feel like the time zones, I mean, New Zealand, honestly, it, it feels like it's Mars. It's just, they're never awake when we are. No. Um, so I've sent her some messages of encouragement, got a few of those out on the on the socials. Um, they've been all over the place. They went swimming in the sea. They were a like everyone was checking out this big waterfall that's somewhere on North Island. I have a feeling I went to that North waterfall very long ago when I was there. Uh, but it sounds like they're having a good enough time and they got a resounding result over the weekend. So Yeah. All things coming together very nicely. And actually, it's very nice to be talking about some positive stuff, given what we've just gone through over the last hour or so. It does feel, Rita Ora at the opening show, mm. we've got a lot of feel-good factor around the women's game at the moment. I've been, blown away by the, yeah, I've been blown away by the amount of coverage. Um, yeah. You know, obviously, it's one of those bizarre things that um, everyone got behind the Lionesses, but the Red Rose has been doing so well for so many years. And have been, you know, especially on this unbeaten run and to... And to beat Fiji, you know, 84 points with a 7-17 um, yeah. it is, is incredible. I, What I've loved is every time you go on social media now, they're getting the coverage they deserve um, and they're getting the kind of um, the recognition. And I, and I, you know, I hope if they, they go on to win the tournament like they should do, that they come back and they get the bus tour and they get everything they should do um, because that's what's important really. And, and I was I was sort of, it was almost bittersweet when the Lionesses, from just from a personal point of view, I'm just talking as, a, as an overview, seeing their success, everyone getting very excited and I sort of wanted to put my hand up and say, excuse me, we've got yeah. a load of women over here. 26 doing, game unbeaten yeah, run. Yeah. They've been yeah. doing it, who have won a World Cup before um, and they sort of deserve those plaudits. But I hope now, with the appetite to showcase the game, with the appetite to get the social media and actually get that instant mm -hmm. kind of recognition. You know, before, if it wasn't being sort of streamed or put on a TV channel, you wouldn't see it. But now everyone's their own paparazzi. Everyone's carrying every single moment. Every uh, media outlet is out there. And I think there's a real move to of, of empowerment. And I think it's very, very special. I've really enjoyed it. The one thing about this tournament being a year late um, uh, means that the countdown to the next one uh, it's around the corner in 25 it's coming here yeah um and there are rumors of it going to hq um there is a game in the early in the new year that will be played there as well but there's lots of promise on the horizon of that exact thing that you loved about the lioness's success coming to england well, well, they, they've well, openly said that they want to sell out twickenham 
Yes. For for a Red Roses match. I think they yeah. will do though. I think they will do now. Yeah. Uh, again, I just it's one of those things where it, it almost takes a a nudge for people to and, and football is always the path the, the leading pathway. You know, they're the pathfinders and everything just because it is the global game. Yeah. And when you see Wembley, you know, fill to that extent, and suddenly people go, oh, "What what else is there out there?" Yeah. And and I think it can be very frustrating. I would imagine it's very frustrating for a lot of people who've been in the mix for a period of time. But it's very good, and it's better late than never. Um, and I think it'll be amazing. And I, we obviously, I don't know where we were, where they they said the. I think actually I was at the Wasp Legends event where they were presenting um, some legends, uh, Mayden, Blazers, it yeah. Was, it? And 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 the first thing she said was that, you know, the dream is to sell out a, a, a Twickenham Stadium. And you know, I think when when we spoke to to Scars, and they were getting maybe four thousand, five thousand down at a game and now they've obviously every game's the records been beaten you know, we were at um welford road which i think was a record at the time i mean, i see them doing it uh, with room to spare to honest you so i am very old and dusty and pretty middle lane to middle age and I, I think i've said before that i covered for sky in 2010 the women's rugby world cup at the surrey sports park which is actually where quinn's train now and i am not lying when i tell you that our studio was a sort of two-bit bob gantry a couple of sandwiches, a couple of cameramen, and I'm I'm not exaggerating when I say I reckon there were probably thirty people in the, in the ground, and they, these were the midweek games, so they were Wednesdays, and I think maybe they got up to a couple of hundred at the weekend, but it was really not a very big event, and you know it was a great sense of excitement, and it felt like you know it was giving the it was being given the television treatment, but there wasn't a lot of buying. The tournament actually grew rapidly throughout the six, seven weeks of it. And actually, they ended up setting up the Twickenham Stoop for the final. It was England, New Zealand, and, and the Black Ferns won. But that sort of felt like a real touch point. But the fact that we are now talking about massive crowd, record crowds at Eden Park, Rita Ora as the headline act, we have got a Red Roses team who are absolutely sensational, but actually a lot of other teams coming up yeah. and coming up quickly as well. What did you make? We'll come back to Emily and the Red Roses, but what did you make of the, the other fixtures, the other teams, and actually a lot of the other stories yeah. around the tournament coming into it this year? The opening match uh, was uh, South Africa, France. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, France, the Black Ferns and England all um, didn't really pitch up really strong in their first halves of the tournament. It's interesting because they're all such strong sides and all of their opponents got beaten, but they they put in a massive showing in the first 30 minutes, like a really intense pitch in. South Africa scrummed really beautifully. Um, they did a few things around the park, which was brilliant. Um, and so I think they could be very proud of that effort against France. Um, and the same can be said for Fiji and the way they played yeah. against England. They so scored... well, the think it's their seventh test. It's the first time they're ever playing at a Rugby World Cup. And these girls are police officers and mums. They don't have enough money to pay for bus fare to get to training sometimes. I mean, the kind of decisions and the real life things that they have to overcome in order to play for their country. Yeah. Um, a lot of these South African girls literally flew somewhere for the first time in November last year when they came over here and then had family that they didn't have enough money to video call with for the entire time that they were touring over here for the four weeks because their families don't have internet at home and don't have enough airtime on their phone. So these are girls who come from the most rural of parts um, and they've in the last year come to England, they've been to Japan and now they're playing at a Rugby World Cup in New Zealand. So for me, it was just great seeing them there and seeing them play France. Um, I think the the account that a lot of these teams gave of themselves, um, considering where they are and how few tests they've played. Um, South Africa has seen the biggest jump on the world ranking so far this year, but they did put centuries up against teams like Namibia. Yeah. Um, and that shows you the gap in women's rugby because they took 40 from France. Can I ask you, and this isn't a loaded question, take it wherever you want, what sort of buy-in is the Springbok women's team getting in South Africa? I think there's been a surprising amount of buy-in from private sector, from brands. Um, I've seen the kind of treatment the girls have gotten from, um, you know, the kind of TV ads and the coverage of it um, has been impressive. I think structurally behind the scenes in the boardrooms, it's still a very different story. The stories that I'm hearing are still quite frustrating. Um, I feel like sometimes the administration of the sport itself doesn't, quite see the opportunity for what it is and it is a massive opportunity because you can double your audience in five years literally double your audience in five years yeah. you don't have to change anything and playing numbers and 
if you just in, teach et cetera, et cetera. girls to play rugby at their local school, primary school, in five years, seven years' time when they leave school, suddenly they're a different rugby consumer. Especially as it's it's is the national sport. Well, I know obviously cricket's a big uh, you know a big one in South Africa, but but when you're talking about trying to make uh, rugby popular over here, you compete against football, cricket, everything else. In South Africa, it's you know, it's right cricket, up there. Yeah. It's a no, it's a no brainer. In New Zealand, you can understand why they've had a, st a strong women's team for such a long time. But yeah. most of these other countries, it's not even the men's team isn't the most popular sport. But in South Africa, it is like it's madness, really. You're not up against it, and there are so many communities in South Africa where the parents won't let. So the school I went to, I can't see girls playing rugby there. Um, even though it's a big rugby school. But there are communities where mums and dads would only be too grateful for, their, for anyone to teach their daughter almost any sport, almost any coaching, anything that keeps them busy in a constructive manner um, in a way that develops their character and, um, and, and physical kind of strength and um, just gives them a, f a sense of belonging. There's so many of those kids in South Africa who are just waiting for something to excel at. Mm. Um, and the, the depth of talent is insane. Um, so I'm really excited for that to just happen and for the little fire to just catch. What has been the biggest sort of eye-catching moment or what's been the most heartwarming moment for you of this opening weekend? Biggest surprise, potentially. I think it's probably a bit of a cliche. This isn't a surprise, but I was just stunned by how taken aback I was by that haka because it's so different to the haka the men do. And this haka had three women leading it, three different female voices leading it. And then the formation that they were doing. And then the wallaby, the wallaroos came. They had the V formation yeah. in the beginning and then they started charging it and they went all the way up to the line. And like, I just felt like there were a few times during that haka where I went, ooh, <laughs> what are they doing now? This is taking off. Um, so that was just, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. That yeah. was just uh, spectacular. And also the the fans with the little poi balls, like it just, all of it felt very New Zealand, but in a way that is very feminine and strong at the same time. Fantastic. I mean, there are some really positive vibes surrounding the entire tournament. I did also want to ask you about Wales, Scotland. I mean, mm. absolute heartbreak for oh. Scotland. And there are some, you know, there's, there's a lot of emotion, as, as many people will know, around this Scotland side, and particularly around Siobhan Cattigan, etc. They are playing for enormous sort of personal motivations, I know. But I mean, Wales pulling it out of the oh. fire like that. I mean, it, there's, there's a fair amount of kind of I was going to say, obviously, high stakes drama, but there's there are, there is a, perhaps a greater level of competition within this tournament than, than some might have expected. That game, right at the end, um, I, I mean, if, if I if I could, I would have shouted at the TV, but I I could hear someone sleeping upstairs, <laughs> um, and I was trying to be as considerate as possible on a Sunday morning at seven. It was just really good to see the competitiveness, the the Italian anthem, the girls singing the Italian anthem were, I mean, absolutely almost bursting veins level of intensity and crying and screaming and dedication. And then they did come away with the win. And um, the family members, all of the footage that there is of players hugging their mums and their dads and just the, the level of desolation and just um, sadness that overcame the Scottish girls at the end of that. I don't know if, like, I can't do another Scottish outcome like that because I feel for those girls. I, I mean, they, they play with so much heart and Rachel Malcolm's the kind of captain that I can see why, like, the girls follow her the way they do. Yeah. Um, so, it, but it is, it was great entertainment. It was just good entertainment. <sighs> So on to England. Um, we we were saying, well, it, it feels like it's England's to lose because of the form that they're on, the professionalism, etc. Does does that? Well, actually, do we find that out this weekend? Do you think with the game against France? I w I was wondering this earlier today when I was reading some stuff on the outcome of the games. Do you know that in the Where the Rose documentary that's um, on ITV that you can go watch now, they they spend quite a bit of time in the beginning of the first episode, but also re they reflect on the sec in the second part on how the Roses lost the final last time and mm. how the Black Ferns came out in the second half of that final and played a completely different game. And this morning at one point, I was like, I wonder how much of that, how much of the strategy is built around the fact that you want to keep your powder dry in some areas for those big knockout games and really blindside one or two teams? I, I, I agree with you, and it's always a science of a 
of when you're playing on a big occasion like that. But it's also, if you don't get there, it becomes irrelevant. Yeah, it's futile. And, and, yeah. and a lot of people try and hide those kind of weapons. And I'll be honest with you, if you execute your game plan to such a degree and you worry about yourself, it becomes a, it becomes a, a, a formality, you know. And I think we're actually looking at some of the stats and I think, you know, um, England's tackle percentage is like 84%. Mm-hmm. That, you know, there's going to be room, there's massive rooms to improve that, you know, especially against... Um, the black ferns they need to they need, you know the red roses are going to need to change that that kind of mindset and i think there are lots of areas to work on and i think you if i if you're playing a tournament you've got to play knockout rugby for the moment you start um and i, I know what you mean whether it's hidden gen, game plans and agendas but you'd look like a muppet if you went well we saved that vital move or we kept our our powder dry and they never they never got that i think france is a big a big um you know h- hurdle for them and i think they're dangerous you know i i think of all the games i i saw they they sort of run over the Black Ferns so easily. Mm. But France was a, such a physical, you know, a physical team. And there was a real kind of it's fire. The ones you know the best. That's what I mean. That's the thing. Yeah. And I think, I think, I think those French girls, I, I think for me, this would be a real test. If they steamroll a France, then I think, you know, all, 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 you know, all bets are on. If they, if I think if it goes a bit tighter, then we'll see. What's interesting is France wasn't ruthless against South Africa. No. Not the way they could have. But it might just be that they, um, everyone went into the opening matches on, on Saturday morning, I think a little kind of, they seemed rusty. Uh, there's not going to be any rustiness, I think, on Saturday. It's just going to be interesting to see what the tactic is. But that game for this time zone is also in a much more convenient time zone. So I'm really excited for more people than ever to tune in and actually watch that because of the scale of the occasion and how important this game is to the rest of the tournament. Um but also because we'll see them compete um, at this level. Uh, it's crucial, as you say, like you really just want to put your best out there. I just, I, I, yeah, I, I think the rivalry is, is weird. That the Red Roses versus the French, there was a, a more of a like a, a, a fierceness to the occasion. There was a yeah. bit more of a grudge match. Mm. Some of those contacts, you know, you're a bit like, wow, uh, there's a real sort of vendetta between the two sides. And I know that they ended up, you know, overcoming them quite easily in there in the Six Nations, but I just think that'll be the, the one for, for, for me that I need to watch out. And they need, they're going to need to improve. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that documentary because we, or you and and Skaz are obviously doing a lot to sort of generate the characters within the game. It's not just about growing women's rugby. It's about growing the characters within the game at the same time. And the thing that falls out of that documentary is that, I mean, you know, one Hask is enough for the men's game, mm. but you've got probably quite a few characters in there who you could file into that under that live wire. I think about Marley, who we love, and we've had on, yeah, on the show before, just an absolute head case whenever she puts her boots on. But there's some amazing sort of people like Abby Dow, who you think are sort of quite composed, skillful, and then you see her falling off the walk by going, fuck that shit. And you're like, yeah. right, okay, cool. Oh, yeah, we can live with this. Okay. <laughs> what, what opportunity do you think there is for characters to come out of this tournament as well as the growth of the women's game, in inverted commas? That's why I love the fact that that, documentary was made and i've heard rumors about a potential third part like throughout the tournament being on the cards as well because this is exactly the kind of content that you can get in the women's game you can get access to a lot of these players they are they are such interesting people they've all got careers and jobs i went and interviewed jade kunkel roberts the other day at her fire station and we were filming uh, luckily we we d- done the first chunk of it and we were still shooting and she was standing doing one of those hero poses in front of the engine and the next thing the siren went and she <laughs> ran, ran off grabbed the jacket ju- jumped on the truck and off they went and we went Oh, so we've wrapped now. That's when... you know you should have gone with. Can you not hop on the back? Oh no, 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 no. They were like, no, no, that's your lot. Shh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, bye. Right. Um, and I just love. I mean, watching her play on Saturday morning again, I was just like, Whoa. yeah. I mean, how thrilling is it on Sunday? It was so thrilling to think that all of these women have these massive big lives and like careers and personalities and like families and stories. And I mean, the, 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 the story around players coming back from injury is very rugby and very sport. Mm. Abby Dow's one is, I mean, that is. How quickly did she get back from her broken very leg? graphic under six months. That's and it's a nine month injury. I mean, they, they took screws out of her shin. On the thing, you can see this, the the marks where they took the screws out because it was hurting so yeah. much, and um, <clears throat> that's yeah. a lot. Yeah, <laughs> welcome to the game. I, I do think um, 
we talked about the, the men's game and Eddie Jones, I think, said it quite recently about the kind of lack of self-reliant players or self-resilient players and having you know everything spoon fed to them and that they can't cope unless they get everything help because they're not independent because they're just on the rugby lifestyle whereas you've got a set of women who who are as you said all, all got jobs they've all got life experience they've, and i think ultimately obviously you want the game to become as professional as possible and mm. for them to be paid what they deserve but actually in the grand scheme of things it's much better because they do have lives they do have personalities you know, this is something they do because they love it. Yes, they, they get paid, but not, you know what I mean? It's not all encompassing. It means you get a different variety of person. So suddenly you've got a worldly wise person you're interviewing as opposed to a naive sort of kid who's come off a conveyor belt. And I love it. When you see that, when you see the stories and kind of the the rich tapestry of all of those lives, it's 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 amazing. And that's why I'm, we're always so eager to give more exposure yeah. mm. because you'll, you know, be blown away. You're like, well, if you think the men's game is boring and it hasn't got any personalities anymore, well, you should come and check out the women's game because it's got what you're looking for and you yeah. don't even know it. And they're really generous with with their stories. They're really generous with it. Like they're not, they're not holding back. They're not trying to shy away from attention. They're not worried. It's weird. It's like there's just not this um, structural a systematic suppression of people's identities in women's rugby because almost everyone who works in the ecosystem knows every bit of exposure you get, like that tide, ra all of our boats rise with, with mm. it, which is, I mean, that's... A they rising say tide that. floats all yeah, boats. Yeah, that so one. They, they, <laughs> he knows all the little sayings. Oh. They did say, um, I don't know who it was we talked on uh, with Good Scouts Rugby, or maybe we did, a, I think maybe one of the, the Vodafone's um, Lions Legacy. Legacy days where we went on there, about that actually the media questions are now turning a little bit mm. so you sort of walk in it's yeah. like how are you everything good now they're going oh what do you think of all the issues with the concussion yeah. what do you think of yeah. this did you see so and so said this yeah. and and the media has turned it into a bit more of a hostile environment and i just hope it doesn't sort of weedle but out in some that ways that, that that shows that the credibility is now there yeah. it's not a sort of well done for pl turning up yeah. it's a you now need to be held accountable and you, i mean you've just done it 84 percent tackle completion rate is not good enough no. if you want to win a world cup and that in some ways it's it's a two. Why are you smiling? Well, <laughs> like, I don't think we want to. We don't think we need me putting the uh, putting yeah, the into anything. You, you do throw we? Your I mean, I'm, you know, I've got this armed guards here. I'm allowed to be doing anything to do with women's rugby. So we just relax. So that wasn't my quote. I was just saying when you look at the stats, Simon Middleton exactly, will want well, to exactly prove what it. you said. Yeah, yeah. Haskell lambasting the performance. Yeah. Comes I'm out literally thinking about every word that I'm saying. <laughs> I've never honestly. I have. You never, look exhausted. I have. I've never had to think so much about making sure that I use the right references, the right parlance. So I'm terrified. You loved the game long before that incident came along, I, and you are interested in the game long after it has gone. I and did, of sorry. course, in true Hask fashion, you're not leaving. You're staying here, <laughs> no, having no, the very no. uncomfortable conversations the whole yeah, time. Right. It is actually, it is actually, it is actually interesting. Again, just trying to make sure that you do yeah. everything justice and trying to think about the the, the right the right thing you know i've never had to think so much. normally i don't even think what i'm supposed to think you know I go on national tv like i'm on loose women and i'm talking absolute nonsense yeah i never have to think i don't care if I, but with this i'm like yeah. right if okay. someone can now take that massive elephant out of the back <laughs> of the room that'd be much appreciated um what are our hopes this weekend i'm just trying to find the fixtures i've got so many notes here and we so just, many bits we, and bobs. we have missed one thing off you might have oh, come yes. to it go on. That, that um obviously uh, another key member of the good the yes, unfortunately right. Didn't make the cut. Um, so, Mo, our, our thoughts are, are with you. We were all surprised and shocked, I think it's fair to say. And it's very interesting what Simon Middleton said. And I'll just read his his quote. It says, we don't, uh, we don't build our game around our nine, unlike New Zealand or France. Our nine's role is very simple. Get to the breakdown, get the ball into the ten's hands quickly, go to the next one, do it again, and keep repeating it. Mo is a very instinctive player. She wants to run, kick, and pass. She wants to be the centre of the game plan and influential within it. Um, I mean, that... As a, as I a, think when you talk about an instinctive player who run kicks and passes, <laughs> maybe Anton Dupont might be a. That's what I was thinking. Or an Aaron that Smith. Is, that's literally what I said to someone in the week when I was like, uh, someone who doesn't understand the women's game I was like, it's like leaving Antoine Dupont at home. Yeah. yeah. And they went, but surely they, surely they didn't. That's what I mean. That's the most. Uh, uh, as a CV going, if your coach could say he wants to run, kick, and pass, and you're able to do that, and you're an instinctive player, and you're dangerous, yeah. surely you want variety in, in, a, in a tournament where what happens if the metronomic passing between nine and ten and repeating isn't working, and suddenly you need to be able to create create movement around the breakdown. So look, I think that's got uh, that's one of those moments where it's an awful kind of shit sandwich where they basically said, look. Yeah. 
you're really, amazing. really good. Not coming. Yeah, but not really, coming, really good. But you're really good. Whereas, and that's one of the things where a coach has said that to you. There's nothing you can do. That has got no. nothing to do with their talent. Yeah. Nothing to do with their ability. That has gone. We have gone for a tactical decision based on nothing other than our own game plan. And as a player, you've just got to go. Okay, I didn't fit into the plans. It's someone know, breaking up with you saying it's you, it's me, not you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was used to say it's you, not me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, um, do you I know really. when... Uh, You've never broken up with anyone. <laughs> <laughs> when the news came out, um, I was talking to uh, Nikki Thuzik, a leading commentator in the women's game, and he said, the reason this is so painful is because we all know this is the one selection decision that has enjoyed more coverage than anyone has ever received in the history of the women's game. No one has ever had this much attention on them not being selected. Yeah. Um, and it is at the same time the best thing that's happened to the game, the fact that it was front page news on the BBC homepage. And at the same time, the most devastating thing for someone who literally had no way of seeing it coming. I spoke to Bryony Cleal about this at the Weather Rose premiere, and she said, mate, that was so brutal because tons of us knew, Ooh, you know, maybe, but no one, no one saw it. And this. she had worked so hard to get back in. Yeah. We love you, Mo. We love the Mo. You're I starting nine in our hearts. Yes. I did send her a message actually saying, don't forget, you have already won one one and you are now about to take on a world leading podcast and there are so many more chat I mean you won't even remember this in ten years time. Yeah. Did you reply? Uh, about four days later. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> saying who dis <laughs> <laughs> She knows now. Um, we love you, Mo. Come and play soon when the time is right. And actually, there's still a long way to go in the tournament. Let's not, you know, write up, remember Stephen Donald. I keep uh, saying it. That's Every time the tournament comes around, uh, anyone doesn't get paid to say, remember Stephen Donald. Fat go. white bait fishing, stuffed in a kid's shirt and stuck on to kick the winning goal. Yeah. Dreams do come true. Anything can happen. Uh, England, France this weekend. A little prediction, please. Hard fought, full on. Surprise or England to get it done? England has such a long unbeaten run now. Even if they are deeply in like the doldrums with 15 minutes to go, I can still see them pulling it back. So at the moment I can't I can't say that I see it going any other way than another win for England. Wales I mean they've got a hell of a job on their hands against New Zealand. Whoa. How hard can they push the Black Ferns? Where can they push the Black Ferns? Sheesh, those, uh, you cannot let the backs get the ball. I know this is really obvious, but Portia Woodman and Ruby Tui are just devastating. The, the way they play, the way that they are supported by their home fans, the way that um, that Harker fires absolutely everyone in that freaking stadium up the way it, uh, it, they are at home. Wales will definitely want to be competitive but it's it's going to be uh, that is probably the team that you at this world cup i know no one wants to play england but you definitely don't want to play against the, the crowd on on saturday when fiji scored against england was so loud i don't know if they were just riding the effects mics but i couldn't see that much noise but the noise was incredible and i think it's just going to build because now that there is something to celebrate there is footage of them doing that haka there is first-hand accounts of people who've gone and attended the games the Rita Ora stuff is out there it's going to build and it's going to become noisier and bigger yeah um Scotland it's sort of pressure on against Australia but signs of hope straighten up the goal kicking a little bit or is this is this going to be one too far that's really that is a really interesting one I I, I do think that goal kicking is crucial but it's not going to be the thing that wins no. the game against Australia I, I, I don't, it's not going to be the way Scotland and Wales played. Um, and the Wallaroos, after the way they played in the beginning against the Black Ferns, I think will take great heart from that performance. And remember, those girls just have, like, the Australians have this weird swagger about them, especially the Sevens team as well. Like, did you see them at Rugby World Cup Sevens? Yeah. Yes. They pitch up, like, incredibly tanned with the most beautiful plaits, full lashes and lips, and they... I mean, there there is something just uh, some people cannot stand the short shorts and the whole aesthetic of it, and I just feel like it's so distinctly them, and there's just such a clear cut identity there. And in Weather Rose, they do go into hair plaiting a lot, and we see, we see in here Mo talking about the neck fringe, which you just what have to. What is the neck fringe? I didn't get that. 
It's where if you plait your hair, you're still left with little baby hairs that you can't so put in your plait. Do you know when you have oh. like a high ponytail and no, then well, not, no. <laughs> yeah. like you tend no, to have I. like not a little wispy of oh, hair at the back. And it's called a neck fringe. Um, well, some people don't have quite a full fringe. Some people just have like a little wispy neck, like floaty there. But, but don't some people try and grow that out as an alternative and then do yes, something with it as like yes. almost a neck mullet? Yes, which is, <laughs> which is why Skaz says she's mate. You didn't have to talk about it. And she's like, yeah, I just want to show people. That's why... <laughs> So Mo is so beautifully honest and so completely vulnerable. She's like, yeah, that's why I plait my hair upwards at the back to catch all of the neck fringe. Oh, I see. I only learned that because Chloe said something about that yesterday. It was like my neck and I was like, oh, that's what it is. But now I sounded like I knew what was going on. Clever. <laughs> very, very useful. Yeah. Saving nine pounds on the barber trip. Um, we digress. You only pay <laughs> nine pounds for that. I actually do it myself. That's why it looks like that. Yeah. Wow. Make, make yourself a home, Alma. Get comfortable. Feet up on the table, why not? Thanks very much for coming. Uh, we'll leave it there. Anyway. You're going to give us a plug. I was going to. Have this. you got a plug? I've got a plug. Um, yeah, about other bits and bits, because there's obviously a lot going on on the good, the scars and the rugby socials over the next few weeks. Yeah, we're um, going to be you've busy. You've got a lot going on anyway, but yeah, what's happening? Head over to the good, the scars and the rugby socials. Stay across all of the drama of the tournament. We've got a team of the week every week. We're chatting to fans. Uh, we've got uh, head-to-heads to watch out for ahead of each weekend. So if you've never watched women's rugby and you just want to know who the ones are to look out for, where the really key match matchups are ahead of every weekend's action but also if you didn't get up at 2 a.m that's okay we've got you uh we'll keep your diaries up to date with fixture lists and what to set your alarm for uh how to basically do your game plan for the weekend and we've got something very special later this week are as we well. a clue on that or not on brand trousers <laughs> I was like, I, what is it's that? so special. What is the special? They thing? haven't told me what it is. Bertie's reign as the ultimate animal predictor is soon to be over. I mean, do you know how hard I'm trying not to make that? jokes out of this? Because, I, I mean, it's just no. so... Uh, no. You know, right? No. It no. would be so no. easy for As me to say... No. This is the good discussion. It would be so easy behave. to say... <laughs> You've done very well, James. Elmer's going to be... <laughs> the, no, okay. The I won't. cat lady. I won't. I won't. The yeah. cat lady. Yeah. I'm not going to do it. I don't need how to. How many cats have you got? Many. M- many. many. Too many. I only have four. Only four. Only four. And yeah, they were... Which is your favourite? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no hask. No, James. I didn't on do that, it. On that bombshell. Oh and what are they gosh. actually doing? Is the, it like sort of fur, coughing up fur balls in the colours of the teams that they're predicting <laughs> for? Or? I have knitted jerseys from their hair and <laughs> I have dyed all of these jerseys and some of them are white and some of them are green and some of them are blue. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I didn't knit jerseys from cat hair, but we are doing right. cat predictions. Cat predictor. Stay tuned. For Elmer's. On- <laughs> no, James. <laughs> no. Just stop doing that. No. I didn't do it. I know. I you're trying to do it. Do um, it. You are blushing. I mean, I know, it's, it's, it's getting blush. very hot. So it's meltingly warm in here in our new studio. We, have can't, we, we can afford lights, but not air con, unfortunately. Um, thank you for coming to see, see No, in Did English, it? thank you for coming to see us. It is my single um, language. <laughs> it is. I make it sound like mine. Um, we'll do this again throughout the course of the tournament. Good luck to all involved this weekend. Early starts, details across our socials on the Good the Scouts and the Rugby. We have had the bad this week in the game with poor Worcester. Keep fighting the good fight. Uh, that is the end of this week's show. We have toured. We have been the good, the bad, and the rugby, and the good, the scars, and the rugby. And both are produced by the mighty Shara Kilgallen, and both shows are Folding Pocket Productions. Have a very good rest of your week, and we'll see you next time out. Bye for now.